Okay, yeah. Thomas, welcome sure. here. I'm going to briefly introduce Thomas, but like everybody knows him literally, everybody who heard of Hugging Face probably knows Thomas. So he is the chief science officer at Hugging Face. And probably not as well known fact is that he was the only, the, that's the main developer of Transformers library be, before it became huge, before they started hiring people. Um, and yeah, you, you were also co-author on a lot of cool papers. I think Distill Bird was one of the earliest ones I saw. And then uh, was it Bloom recently? And a ton of more interesting work. But yeah, I'm going to stop there and just like hand it over to Thomas and like to hear a bit more about, I guess, Hugging Face and um, and behind the, the scenes details. Hey guys, I want to give a huge shout out to Hyperstack folks who have generously sponsored my compute over the past month or so. Uh, basically, I got 16 H100s, which is two uh, 8 GPU nodes, and the performance has been amazing. Basically, 2x the speed up compared to my A100 nodes. So I want to quickly show you how you can get started yourself. It takes basically three steps only. You go to the environments here, you create a new environment, you give it a name, you pick between Canada and Norway. That's the first step. The second step, you go to uh, SSH keys here, you create a new pair, you pick the environment you just created, you give it a name, you paste your public SSH key. That's it. And finally, go to virtual machines, deploy a new machine, give it a name again, select environment. Let's select Canada here because they have more compute there. Then you select the hardware you want, like for example, H100s. You select the images, you select the SSH key you just created and hit deploy. That's it, literally a couple of minutes to get started. It was really easy for me to, to just uh, um, basically cre create these two nodes I just mentioned and get started running LLM trainings. So the documentation is super cool. I, I could actually solve all of my problems just by looking at their docs. They additionally have a Slack channel where, where they were super helpful, so I can't recommend them enough. Uh, honestly, the, the thing they kind of focus on is basically because a lot of these GPU providers focus on, on big enterprises. So oftentimes you can't get on demand H100s, whereas NextGen focuses particularly on that. You can get top of the line hardware on demand, even if you're if you're an individual or like a smaller team or whatnot. They also focus on bigger companies, but that's kind of their, their edge here. So without further ado, guys, let's go back to the talk. I do suggest you check them out and let's continue. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Alexa. Um, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, basically, uh, I have a couple of slides, but uh, what I really like is usually to, to talk about, you know, what, what interests uh, everyone here, what is the thing that you that you like. Uh, briefly, what I did at Hugging Face was uh, starting all our open source efforts. Basically, anyway, uh, sorry for interrupting. If you can just share mm -hmm. the slides because we don't see them now. And also, if anybody has questions, as usually, just post it in the chat or raise your hand so I can moderate so we don't interrupt Thomas too much. Only I can interrupt you. <laughs> yeah, let me share it. Yeah. And, okay. uh, and since a couple of years, I've been moving to, to maybe more uh, starting our science efforts. So uh, let me show you quick this slides. Uh, I'll share this window. And you're now okay. now in North Africa, right? On a on a uh, like a team meeting there with the Morocco team. Yeah, in yeah. Building. So Hugging Face is a, is a full full remote company with a couple of offices, uh, but we don't have any requirements around where you want to live. And so our way to tackle that is to do regular uh, team meetings. So for instance, this week, we're working one week from uh, Agadir in, uh, in Morocco with, uh, with eight people in, uh, in, uh, in the team. Uh, so that's really cool. We try to do that regularly. Um, OK, so uh, that's a brief intro around Hugging Face, I would say, focusing on LLM which used to be a side of AI, but now it's kind of full AI, I would say. So it's focusing on AI generally, that's what I can say today. Uh, so quick history. Um, you see my screen, right? Yeah, I see it here as well. OK, so basically what happened recently in the past 10 years was uh, in 2011, software was starting to eat the world, uh, basically changing everything to become software-based since five years maybe a bit more like uh, seven years, let's say now, deep learning was starting to eat software. And recently, transformers have been starting to eat deep learning. And today, we have generative AI, which is uh, this huge scaled transformers and uh, division model, if you put, if you put uh, the two main architectures of today in them, 
which are kind of driving all the progress in research and application. I think there is a, maybe the most important thing that happened last year, I would say, is the turning point in usage where ML used to be really, you know, this ML software engineer kind of niche field. And now everyone knows about ML, right? Everyone knows about ChatGPT. My grandmother is asking me my opinion on ChatGPT and basically, <laughs> We moved from this like side, slightly nerdy, you know, feel to basically the center of uh, the new uh, technology revolution. So I think that's that's really that's really impressive. It's sometimes a bit uh, a bit scary, almost right, because uh, it also caused bring a lot of challenges, a lot of questions around how you how you how you should build AI. At least that's something we we're, we're thinking a lot about at Hagi Face how we want the future to be. Uh, one of these things is the question of open source AI. Should it be open or not? I'm obviously slightly biased, right? Because I believe a lot in openness. I think that was maybe one of the most amazing things that uh, computer science in general brought to the whole science field was this idea of open source license, this idea of even like uh, GPL, which is maybe too extreme, but you know, this idea of radical openness and like common good for humanity. I think it's really hard to to name any field that is more, uh, you know, carrying this value than computer science. And so I really think it would be amazing if in the future, in 10 years, you know, AI is this kind of common good that everyone can use, access, understand, and it's not like a boring thing that just to be corporation controlled for everyone, you know, like this kind of dystopian future where you have this mega corporation controlling the whole world. Uh, I don't really want this future. I'm much more excited about future where just like, you know, website, just like Wikipedia, everyone feel like it's a little bit their own thing. Um, but still, there's a lot of question, right? Security, there's a lot of question around rogue AI, existence or risk, also business model, right? How do you make money with something that, that you want to, to make free for everyone? So there's a lot of questions that are not so new, right? There have been question in, at least in the internet and web that's been there for, for a long time. Um, but there's also a lot of like interest, I think, having common good. Uh, everyone can access it. I'm here in Morocco, right? So uh, I think like if you want them to be able to own AI, there's only open source as a way for them to really be able to own this thing. Um, you can share resource. There's a lot of questions about privacy. Maybe it's better that your model is running on your own computer and not on some computers from someone else who you know needs to get your data for you from you and, uh, and send it back. There's a lot of question around transparency and trust. And my, my deep opinion is that the more something's open and transparent, the more you, you can trust it. So yeah. But obviously there is a, there is definitely good good question, good criticism on the side of, of closed AI. And I think it's nice to to be able to really aware of you know both sides, I would say. So uh, quick, I want quick, quick question here, Thomas. Yeah, sure. uh, like when you were just getting started, I remember you started, I think maybe even in 2003. 13 or 14, I, I might be wrong with the, with the emotional chatbot. Like I, before you, you kind of pivoted into the uh, transformer space. Uh, so I'm curious, when did uh, being bullish on open source and just like pro open source come to be a part of your culture? Like at which point did that happen actually? Because I know it was not the, the, the case from the, from the get go, which was, as I said, a long time ago, as far as I know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I think we we started at least that's that's something I started quite early at Hugging Face as a really side project, you know. Uh, so at the time you, we were this very small, uh, you know, uh, startup with three underdogs from France, like who who were definitely not uh, in the Silicon Valley kind of standard the way to to build a startup. So we had to get known. We had to to kind of prove ourselves and. Making some open source, making some papers, some open knowledge was 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 my idea, was our idea, I would say, for getting taken seriously and quickly, you know, being visible. Uh, so that was really a side thing, uh, and the idea was, okay, if people, you know, if use a bit our open source tools around the the chatbot technology we're building, then it will be maybe easier to raise money, and we have a bit more visibility. And what happened is that. Uh, it was it became not just uh, you know something on the side but it it very quickly started to grow exponentially in terms of github like issues pull requests like people reaching out and saying hey we're using your uh, so at that time it was pytorch pre-trained bird so that was basically the beginning of transformers uh we really love that and so at some point 
like roughly nine months after we after after I've started, you know, to 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 open source the first version of Transformers, and we were preparing to raise our first Series A. So basically, our first uh, real round. We we did, we were looking at all our numbers, and there was one number which was clearly growing exponentially, and that was all the open source thing. So we're like, okay, maybe there is actually something exponentially growing there. And when you're building a startup, that's really what you're looking for. You're looking for a sign that there is a growing interest in what you build, right? Um, so that's, I would say, this the signal. But maybe deeply, if you if you look at that, we both Julien, me, and Clément, we really believed uh, in this. Uh, in particular, Julien and me, as computer scientists, we really believed in the open source thing, right? It was like all. We, we both had open source projects before. Um, me before coming to science, computer science, I was doing physics and I was really frustrated by all the difficulty you can have in physics to access knowledge. You need to pay for publication. You need to, even when you publish an article that you wrote in a publication, you have to pay to be able to read your own thing that, you, that you're sharing. So all the difficulty to access knowledge um, were really frustrating. And I think that kind of make me a little bit uh, yeah, that kind of made me believe in this mission of, yeah, you know, freeing knowledge. Of being the archive of open source, I guess, would be a yeah. fair way to put it, <laughs> or GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. I'm taking a look at the at the chat. You don't, you don't have to, I'm going to read those as well. I think yeah, it's mostly yeah, comments. <laughs> Bonjour. Okay. Thomas, um, but yeah, <laughs> if you want to know, so, so basically Hugging Face at this time pivoted to first this idea of having a library to share models. And then on top of it, we build the, the hub. So at first, uh, the idea was just uh, let's put models on the open S3 bucket. That was really the first thing. And for a long time, people were just directly uh, getting from the, from the S3 bucket. Which was nice, but obviously very slow as well because it's not really made for that. And so we pivoted to a hub with like Cloudflare and like basically everything to make this very easy to download gigabytes or even now terabytes of, of data of models, you know. And and then uh, around this came uh, maybe the, the second push. Uh, so one one year after, where it started as another library, uh, which was which is called Dataset. And the idea here was now that you have nice access to model data is still really really annoying to get right there is like all these various places where people store it all these various formats or these various like file files formats and so we thought maybe we could here also make this like a, a like a common hub to to share data and that was the second push and more recently came the more like demo aspect which spaces that have been like exploding like crazy um so but let, let me quickly go yeah, to my that was like because... post acquisition of radio right the spaces yeah. became a thing yeah 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 basically it was a kind of a bet that uh, people would want to to have a very quick access to model and the idea was if you want to understand and inspect the model the best way is to play with it and i think that's that's one of the great thing about uh, chat gpt i think it's that it allowed so many people to try ai to try ai models and that's what is still very frustrating with you know um, this release where you can't even try the model is that you don't really get a feeling for what the model is good at. So I think that was our idea. And what happened is that coupled to the fact that many people who were not ML scientists or even even not computer scientists started to to try AI, you know, they also wanted this kind of simple interface to play with model. And in particular, I think stable diffusion was maybe the first really widespread use of uh, AI, um, even before ChatGPT, uh, AI models in like non-computer science community. But yeah, so today, basically, uh, the Hugging Face Hub is about model and data. Uh, it's, be, it's growing like like crazy right models we, we we're actually above so these are numbers from september's uh last year so they're like three months old and and we are now above the the million total repository so it's all been growing quite strongly uh we have models we have data set we have spaces like i was saying the idea of the model it's, hub is to sorry cover... for interrupting thomas if you can yeah. go back like the the last slide um again as a as a, as a for-profit business and you you mentioning open source and how do you monetize stuff like i i have to ask a question like given like even a couple of days, I was just like uploading some stuff and you have it for free. And it was like literally gigabytes and gigabytes of like models and data and all of that. Like, do you, given that this is kind of going exponentially as, as more people are going into the field, like, 
do you feel this is going to be sustainable as as in you're always going to have this free tier or you have to do something to just like reduce the the strain yeah i mean the, the first thing to keep in mind is is a uh, i mean storage is not very expensive in the end right so our compute costs are often over overestimated by people you know we, we are we're mostly cash flow positive most of the time where we don't really want to stay cash flow positive because we've raised money and our investor they want us to use the money and not just put it on bank account and sign but uh our computer our computer costs are, are quite low i would say for for the the numbers there but that's also because we don't provide so much you know of the very expensive compute which is running gpu for free right this is really the the thing where you start paying 12 euro per hour or whatever thing um so yeah, I'm really not worried about this being sustainable. Uh, at the at the moment, it's it's really low, um, but I think it's something you have to be really mindful. Not not every compute costs the same, and and you want to you want to find like you want to find. I think dep depend how you want to create your, your startup. But I think a good idea if you want to create an open source startup is to follow the road of making something that's really hard to kill because it's very lean. And I think that's what we're trying to do all the time because open source take a long time. Like these are great numbers, right? But I mean, we started in 2018, so that's five years ago, right? So uh, it still takes some time to take off. You, t you need some time to build a community. And so you should be prepared for that, right? If you want to build those, if you build an open, uh, an open source startup and you only have one year, I mean, in the beginning, you don't have a lot, but uh, if you're starting to grow the team and you still only have one year of runway, that's that's a bit tricky. And maybe you should be very careful about what kind of compute you're giving you're giving for free. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. So the hub, yeah. So I mean, you know it, right? I won't spend too much. Um, we like to focus on inference, which is try to make it easy to use the model, uh, in particular because there's a lot of challenges. Um, in LLM, so here I, I list the most important one. The first one is model size. Um, it's funny because for a long time it was really what people were saying: "Oh, this is never going to work. GPT three is too big, and the GPT four is too big, and we're never going to be able to use this model." But what happened today is we see we have Llama CPP. We can make a, a very good model work locally, and so basically, um, I'm never really so so worried about model size. Though I think it's really cool as a challenge because quantization, optimization of these models is, is really a nice thing, and there's still a lot of room. Um, evaluation is something we've worked a lot on last year in terms of trying to make it uh, more standardized. We have something called the Open LLM Leaderboard, uh, which is just one aspect of evaluation. We want to do a lot more, but I think it's really tricky. In particular, when you start where you know, like 500,000 models, I was saying, showing the question is, how do you choose the model you want to use, right? And I think the only way is really to have good evaluation. Uh, customizability is really nice for open source model. You can fine tune them, you can adapt them. So that's really important. And optimization, that's a little bit like connected to model size, obviously. Um, and talking about evaluation, by the way, like it's very hard, even for English. And like what's very close and dear to my heart is like multilinguality and, and other languages. And it gets even harder because there is literally no evals you can use. So yeah. it's just like a crazy hard problem and it can be hacked. And I'm really bullish on LLMC folks that the thing they're doing. I don't know whether you guys like I know you have a, like a quantitative eval, but do you, do you have a playground like a like arena type of a thing as well? Or I, I don't think I've seen that if you have. No, I would say that's one of the things where I think what they do is really cool. So we're mostly helping them. We have a space. We give them compute. You can use the chatbot uh, LMC arena on, on the hub. We share the data. And I think a lot of the time, what we don't, what we don't really want is to compete. We don't really need to compete with what the committee is building. We want more to, to either to like uh, support them, to try to give them like things to make them grow, or when there is an obvious gap, to to try to make something ourselves. But like, I think here, the L what the LMC is doing is really, really great. And so uh, there is no, um, I mean, it could be better. Obviously, like every every project, you could add stuff to it. Could be multilingual, for instance. That would be really great. So if you want to start something like that, we, we should talk and we could see if we if we can help you uh, with some compute with nice space or visibility on this. Um, so right now, what we want to do in evaluation is mostly unlock a lot of people to do um, evaluation and try to see if we can give them like template for leaderboard, easy things so they can just 
you know, plug what they know, which is often they, they still have some idea about the data set that they could use, or at least they know the language and they can look for it. And so uh, we want to try to unlock a lot of like open leaderboard from the community and try to make them visible. So uh, that's what you will see soon. Uh, I think we have at least four or five projects or collaboration we try to help there. Um, Amazing. There, there is one question that's from the chat that's really good. Uh, Rafael asks, do you envision ML journals enforcing open source principles in the future, such as reproducibility and openness? Yeah, that's good. I, I think they already, there is already some incentive to be open, right, to share the code. And there is, depending on the journal, obviously, uh, and the conference, but there is some incentives. Um, I would say the main tricky thing here is that uh, we see definitely a lot less publication. That's a bit sad, but like a lot of like, you know, famous researchers we know, they kind of now work in place where they don't publish. So that, I think that's an unfortunate development. Now I would like this to change in the future. Um, on the other hand, it also gives more room for newcomers. So I think if you're in academia now, it's also nice. Yeah, LMCs is, uh, is from Berkeley, from uh, Berkeley Lab, it's really, so it's a great uh, academic lab. Um, yeah, so I think there is room for academia again, which is which is nice for academia. But um, there is a question, you know, if you if you ask openness in ML journal, which which real part of the community are you really forcing to 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 be open? And if people don't publish at all, yeah, yeah, VLLM is also from uh, LMCs. They're really um, a, a lot of cool projects coming from Berkeley, definitely. Like SkyPilot, VLLM, all of those projects are yeah. starting in Berkeley. Super cool. Yeah. I think this type of project where you where you really tackle head front, you know, the challenge is like, okay, we, we will try to build this this chat and now we'll try to make this efficient, like flash attention is also a project that's kind of come to mind. This type of project, there's still a lot of room if you if you're smart uh, and if you want to do a visible project there's a lot of room there another thing yeah actually uh so some cool project i like bits and bias i guess you probably know them quantization is, is like really really something that has been amazingly efficient for llm i would say it's really crazy uh and there's still some room to to grow uh multi gpu we work a lot on that um we have this nice tech generation in france which is a uh, very fast uh it's kind of it's a little bit like vllm uh, the difference that it's coding in rust so it's slightly more difficult to contribute unless you want to learn rust uh, and we tailor it for our own um, in france uh, needs uh, but if you want to give it a try it's, it's a very nice library um quick question on this one Sorry mm -hmm. for interrupting constantly, but I told you it's going to be interactive. Um, yeah. Th this TGI, I, re I remember there was some, like, I don't want to call it scandal, but like the, op the, open the license changed. And, and then I, I remember Yannick tweeting it because he was contributing. Like, what, what's currently the status of this one when it comes to license and how do you think about it? I obviously, I know that your business model is heavily reliant on, on, the, on the inference services you, you, you guys provide. Correct me if I'm wrong, but just want to hear a bit more about this, this topic. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say it's it's one of our, it's one of our experiments. So it's the only library we have which is not uh, Apache two. So this library has a, a specific uh, hash foil license, which basically is generally like Apache two for every every usage, except if you just want to basically uh, sell directly what the if you would just want to sell direct inference services. So if you're just using a service that basically TGI and you're just selling per token what TGI is generating out of the box, right? So you're just basically reselling what the, what the, what the library is directly made to do. Uh, and then we, we want you to, to sign a license. And that was because we had some co-development with this library where, you know, some of our, we were really developing for open source and, and some of our co-collaborator were really directly making business out of it. So, so we wanted to experiment. I would say, um, Given that inference is not actually one of our main revenue at the moment, the qu there is a big question, also a big discussion internally, if we want to keep this exception in our ecosystem. So it's, it's, there is a possibility that in a few months we say we just go back to full Apache 2 ecosystem. Uh, I would say we still want to experiment a bit with this. 
for a long time, we've been playing with a lot of ways, you know, how can you make a sustainable business model out of open source that also match your values? Uh, because we want a business model where the business incentive for us are around more open sourcing of model, more open sourcing of data set, and more open sourcing of library. It's not so easy, right? The easy way is you go, I would say, the open AI way. So you say, okay, we just hide everything and then we sell it. Um, so I think right now we have a nice we have a nice business model where you know the hub is basically our main platform and our main product the hosting of the hub which means the bigger the hub is the more you know the more uh, there is a diverse set of models the better it is and the more it's aligned with with our business model so um, yeah I think that's that's a nicely aligned but yeah TGI is a bit of an experiment in terms of licensing and. Mm -hmm. um, we still, we still, we still unsure if it's something we really want to double down. What is pretty I mean, sure is I, in the future we'll say mostly, re, mostly Apache to uh, this mm. type of license. I don't think people are judging. It's, it's, it was more the change of the license because people know you ultimately do have to make money, and like I, I think it's completely, completely fair. No, nobody yeah. is judging. I, I don't think that's the point. But you said, by the way, the hub thing, like, is that like subscription? This is, you, you, you get money from subscriptions there, or like, what's the model there? Sorry for going so a bit more into startups. And if you if you take a look, actually today we announced a big a big partnership with Google, Google Cloud. So we have partnership with all the major uh, cloud providers as well as also all the major hardware providers, like uh, Nvidia, AMD, uh, Intel, like all of them. And basically, these are these are, I think very interesting partnership because it's not like you know like there is also this other type of partnership where you basically uh, they you you're supposed to only use their compute and they give you money but they actually wait to get the money back when you actually need to buy their compute so we didn't want a partnership like that we wanted a partnership where we're really more on on a on a equal footing and the idea is uh, we have this the hub which is a, an amazing place to find any new model right if you want a new model it's 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 there and on their side they all there every every big cloud providers have their own way to 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 provide you models in their in their own setup right if you're doing using aws you can access model also through aws and, and the same for google cloud and so there is this very natural collaboration where we actually help them integrate all the hub and the models in the hub in their own offering and so they are happy because their customer get access to all the the variety of, of models on our side we're happy because actually it's a nice partnership in terms of uh, distribution of of the hub as well and this is something where the bigger and the more lively the hub is the better it is for both side right so this is really um, the the main the the main um, our main source of revenue at the moment and i think that's something we're much more which much more interested it's also very like it's it's very um diverse in terms of we, we work with all the big cloud providers and all the big hardware providers so i think it's also a very nice thing for the for, for us for the community there is this diversity of thing like if you mm -hmm. want in terms of balance of powers i think it's very healthy for the mm -hmm. future of ai that there is this whole thing so that's our, our first main and the second main uh, source of revenue is the maybe more traditional consulting in our case it's kind of advanced consulting we call that the expert acceleration program where we go help companies who are already quite knowledgeable. They usually are very great data scientists or, or ML team, but they kind of need specific help on one new project. And so these are maybe more closer to the traditional open core, you know, revenue like Red Hat, if you think that the, the traditional uh, open source uh, business. And that's also something we, we like because it let us see a lot of uh, use cases, a lot of application. And so sometimes we see also how to improve our ecosystem for this specific thing, for this specific thing. So these are the main sources. And you see inference is, is a nice thing, but it's it's not among for now our main main source of revenue, I would say. Okay. And I misunderstood that part. Super cool. The the, the hub is definitely win win win, both for you partners and, and people who can use now these models across various platforms who are building apps there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, maybe I can go quickly. You know, you know a bit that we have a lot of things around training. Culora is also very nice for fine tuning model. And uh, these are all things that we can chat about. Um, we were talking a little bit about spaces. Uh, this is also a big part of the hub. 
uh, I would say it started really with all the image model. The first viral thing we had was uh, Dali Mini. If you still remember Dali Mini, it was this reproduction of Dali One that was very uh, cheesy or very mem meme meme uh, type of, of generation. So that was the first viral, and then obviously uh, stable diffusion brought really great models. Uh, today you can use the uh, phenomenon. Like uh, the uh, the Ali Mini was such an interesting phenomenon because I know it started from your hackathon, the the Jack hackathon with Boris Daima, and then yeah. the th already back then you had much better models. But then it was the the the, the fact that it was worse, it made it so much funnier and better and just yeah. spread virally. It was crazy. It was I yeah. think May yeah. or June a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we we had a. Uh, a whole period of time we were doing hackathon and community events where we were giving free compute and this one was with google we were giving free compute on tpu uh, and boris was, was trying to reproduce dali and then uh, and then it was really great and so uh, we managed to convince google to to give him a, a further grant to to work on it for one year which which led to the real dali mini uh, you know out of the quick hackathon thing still took a year to build uh, and that became instantly viral um yeah yeah so that yeah so if you want to use gradio i think today it's 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 the best way to quickly demo um a ml model that you have you can actually use gradio for a lot of things we use it also for the leaderboard and, and you can use it for a lot of low code thing or like a lot of quick interface basically if you know python and you want to build a quick interface that's also a very good alternative to to you know using more complex frameworks so i actually use it a lot um and i would say what i what i've spent uh, quite a lot of time doing in the past few years was this more like open research experiment which was okay can we do research differently than just you know locking 12 people in a room like it's done and, and not sharing anything uh the first one was this kind of crazy big science bloom thing where we had a thousand researchers from all over the world when you see the map that's really crazy that there were so many continents involved uh, it led to uh, a lot of things including bloom which was a big model train multi multi multilingual model um it's still one of the most open projects that have been out there in terms of uh, model training and and data source in particular on data governance um but i think there were a couple of problems with it one problem was the size when you're a thousand people training a model together <laughs> it's actually very hard to take decision and so a couple of decisions that we took in terms of data filtering were definitely under optimal um in terms mm. of so also how much we we wanted and so that led us to a second project that we've been doing which was big code uh, can you just ask about bloom before we go to big code um yeah. I, I know that, by the way, like I know that tokenizer is still super popular in multilingual applications. I'm not sure about the model itself, but I, I remember when the project got started and it was super cool. But I guess the question for me is when you have a thousand people, ultimately you, you did have the supercomputer in France, what, whatever the name was, and like you have only so much compute. How do you, how did you decide who kicks off the actual runs? And so how, how did that part look like? I guess a couple of you only had access or what? Yeah, so that, that was also one thing complex. Or maybe good i don't know but the the compute the supercomputer in france is is um was formerly you know like a, a little bit of a military grade computer so so you could only get access with uh, with clearance and even internally at hugging phase there is some employee who could not were denied access so uh the thing is only like maybe maybe five or six people uh could really you know start runs which on the one hand was maybe still good because then it's it means you know you you you're a little bit bottlenecking at some point so you need to make decision and then you have the people who actually run the experiment who in the end maybe make the decision but it make of maybe a less controlled um organization than the one you would have like to have yeah yeah it's a, it's a tricky thing i would say yeah what what we do for big science is um we have a clearly defined a small team of full-time people, maybe uh, six people, I would say, who are really there full-time, that's their job, right? And then we have a full community of volunteers who come help on side project, but it's very clear that there is a difference. There is a full-time people, they're paid to do that, it's their project. And then you have all the volunteers. I mean, everything is open, right? Everyone can follow what's happening. You can go on the GitHub, um, but you have a little bit of a clearer organization around who actually will take decision when there is decision that need to be made or when they tricky trade off which language we choose in the end. 
you know, is the data set ready or not? Because the modeling people are waiting for it. Should we wait a little bit more? You have a lot of tricky decisions. And if you are too many people, it's, it's a bit hard to, to take this decision. So BigCode was, was running pretty nicely, even though it's still quite big. There is 500 participants and, and the map is still quite big, but there is this a little bit clearer organization uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the workshop or the, of the project. Uh, so that led to uh, a couple of uh, model trains, Starcoder, which was right before we started to have a, a huge a huge run of, of uh, code models. So Starcoder was, was released just before uh, last summer. And then you had a lot of uh, succession model just after that, like uh, Code Lama, uh, Deep Seek Coder, I think is probably the best at the moment. So that, that kind of started this wave. And maybe the most interesting thing out of this project is also the data sets. So for instance, the Starcoder and Bcode was um, trained on the stack data set. And we are really soon the stack two. And what you see is that this became the basis for training many models. So for instance, actually Code Lama is trained on the stack, Stable Coder, Code Gen, Replicate Code. So we realized last year with this project that when you release a good quality data set, you're unlocking really a huge ecosystem. So that's something we want to do more this year. We think it's maybe one of the best way to you know catalyze a lot of effort. It's not so much to provide a fully trained model, but to provide this very good quality data set where you can prove that they are good because you've trained models on them, but actually people can use them and train their own model. 100% agree. One question about the data is, how did you handle the licenses, given how big of a topic that is now with this recent lawsuit with New York Times and OpenAI and all of this? Did you um, just use, yeah. did you just filter like exclusively open source licenses or like in the stack or? Yeah, that's a good question, yeah. I think the nice thing about code is that a lot of time you know the license, so you can make you know conscious uh, choices. So, for instance, the stack one, we we decided to filter only permissive licenses and to keep only people who I would say were okay to have their code reused, even though you could argue they were not aware it would be for ML. But at least it's people who were like giving their code and be happy to do, for it to be integrated on the things. So we filtered for only permissive licenses uh, for the stack two. Uh, what we decide to do is to partner with uh, with a foundation called uh, Software Heritage, which is a, an, a, an, a non-profit that has been working for years in gathering all the code they could gather. And so uh, that was our way to to maybe try to, you know, uh, leverage also a very, a very uh, interesting ecosystem and to have like something where um, we have a partner who is also interested in, you know, having data which is, uh, which is uh, at least accessible in an open way. I mean, I would say it, it's quite complex because in the end, um, if you have, my, my deep opinion is if you have to train a model on data and you're unsure if uh, people really agreed or not on using it, I think at least the model should be open, which means that at least you're producing something open from open data. Uh, but that's there is a lot of like ethical discussion that we could have around this, right? But that's 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 the kind of line where we found ourselves really aligned with software heritage. They've been gathering all this publicly accessible publicly accessible code, and they were like, okay, what do we do? Do we sell it to OpenAI? Do we sell it to private, or do we partner to make like an open code model on top of it? And we and we we were like, yeah, I think in the end, I think that's maybe the best way to do it for now. But I think it's an ongoing discussion actually. If mm. you want to really Hundred percent. Thanks. Thanks for the thoughts. Yeah, yeah that's the last that's slide. There, there is a cool question about like uh, Benoit asked uh, how to apply to Hugging Face. What kind of profiles are you looking for? It is definitely the place I would like to run. Yeah. So I would say kind of profile is um, you have to be. Uh, we only have engineers, I would say. So everyone code, or almost everyone code at Hugging Face, uh, including me, I still code like, I would say 50% of my time. Uh, so uh, you have to really like coding. <laughs> um, you have to really like, like a small environment. So Hugging Face is still quite small, even, even for the impact that we may have, or like the age uh, of, the, of the company in AI world. Uh, we're like 150 people, and it's mostly like small, 
small teams. So usually inside Huggy Face is like, you can imagine 50 small startups with three, four people in them. And every one of these startups is working on something. Some of them work on audio, some of them work on text to speech, some of them work on like that model training. And so um, you have to really like this kind of a small, small team, very, uh, very lean way to work. Like you're very uh, moving from one project to the other. Maybe you work with other people, you rebuild the team. When your project is finished, maybe you join another team on another project. So you have to be comfortable with this and you have to then be slightly more autonomous than in other organizations because you don't have a fixed mentor that will be there and that help you grow in your career. Um, but what we find is people who are happy with this type of like uh, decentralized way of working are, are really happy at any phase. Yeah. So to apply uh, any type of profile, uh, we hire everywhere and use it the best way to sh is to show me uh, a cool project that you've done can be a project for school or can be a side project or can be a project you did uh, in another uh, in another company or another position that you're kind of proud that, that you that you that you're really excited about um yeah we still have internship program um yeah so you can still you can still apply you just go to uh, hf.co slash jobs be Keep in mind, we have a lot of applicants between 400 to like 1,500 for positions. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I did, see, I did see that. It doesn't mean you're bad. <laughs> yeah. I did see that Clem tweeted out like uh, th th like 100,000 applications on the on the on the on the, on the log. Yeah. So that's that's fun. That's a good position to be in. Um, yeah. There is more questions coming in the chat. I had a question about maybe this, this is going to be relevant to everyone, like the, the latest stuff you've done. And I, I see yeah. your tweet on, on the screen as well, Data Trove and Nanotron. Can you tell us maybe a bit more yeah, about so the latest stuff? Yeah, so uh, that's two of the tools we've, used, we've been using last year to, to train LLMs internally. And so we decided to, to release them. Actually, I was, uh, I was filtering the internship for these two positions during the, during the Christmas vacation. I think I went through like about 600 profiles uh, and we selected like 10 of them so that was a uh, that was really really crazy but the people that we found there were really amazing like uh, a dropout we have one dropout from school we have another one who is more like traditional phd but every profile can apply uh, but we have so so good people wanting to join in there so let me tell you a little bit about these two libraries uh, I would say Data Trove is this uh, is this project we have around data. We think this year we want to open source. We want to release more data sets. We want to see you know how we can find this tricky thing. There is copyright question. There is a lot of question, but maybe we can solve it. Maybe we can release it. And in particular, I see less and less organization interested in releasing their data. So I think it's time it's time for us to step up. So Data Trove is this library used to filter common crawl. Um, we've been internally uh, rebuilding one one big data set called Refined Web that was very nicely um, done last year uh, by a team in um, was that Falcon, right? TIA Abu Dhabi. And so they released a part of it, but not the full. And so we've basically rebuilt the library to do all the, the all the filtering, and we'll release the, the the data set very soon. It's in the last mile of. The duplication, which is the only operation we cannot serialize, so we have to wait a bit, but it's almost there. We have about three trillion tokens. Uh, and so data trove is the library we use for that. It's a very nice library, I think. So um you can you can also use it. Guilherme is 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 amazing, the lead maintainer. Uh, Nanotron is is more like our, our playground for 3D parallelism. There is already a lot of libraries out there, I would say um some of them are quite now old for instance megatron is really nice but you you can feel also that it's been there around for quite some time so there's like layers and layers of of, uh, of research in megatron and so we wanted to uh, start from scratch to be able to play with new models like mamba like MOE in a nice um, a very lightweight framework also like transformers is nice but now it's such a huge big library that you can't you don't really want to add 3d parallelism inside of it to just make it more complex so we want this very small framework less than like 10 like 10, lines of code it's actually a lot less it's around 5,000. um where you still have you know something very fast where you still have like compute communication uh overlap and this type of thing and where we can play so that's our playground uh, um 
that you that you can follow that you can use as well it's a little bit more rough i would say but i expect us to release some model using nano nanotron in in the in the future how and the other thing i'm very accelerate how does nanotron compare to accelerate yeah it's a very different philosophy so accelerate is the, this really one line of code change to your code and you directly have uh, data parallelism in particular right so it's very easy to go um with 1d with um, 1D parallelism, so data parallelism. Um, it's also integrated with a lot of nice framework, deep, C, uh, um, deep speed, sorry. And uh, it's something we use a lot, but I think Nanotron is not really made to be a one line of code uh, library. It's more made to really tackle the more complex. So if you want to start do pipeline, tensor parallelism, most of the time you actually want to write the full model yourself and not just try to plug hooks in a transformer that's already made so you actually have to start from scratch which gives you the opportunity also to make something quite smaller i would say in, in footprint so that's this other other idea we don't really want to integrate both i think nanotron will say are kind of a little bit researchy stuff and accelerate will will still be the really go to open source you know one line of code thing to to the parallelization um yeah we're also looking for phd interns and oh okay sorry for you anthony uh, feel free to reapply because as i told you uh, we didn't we definitely could not take everyone who who was who was amazing in the applicant there were just too many people one question from my side you said you're you're coding still was it 50 or 15 percent of your time no it's 50 i would say 50, yes Nice. Yeah. That's a lot. So, what, what's what's the project you're you're contributing the most to right now? Uh, so, Nanotron, I call a lot. Uh, that's how you can look at the the GitHub uh, insights. Uh, I also do boring stuff internally that nobody wants to do, like evaluation. We have an internal evaluation library that we also open source. Uh, I think pretty soon. Um, so, also could, usually I try I take the thing that are not fun and not but not <laughs> no one wants to do right. So that's the bad thing about being the boss is that you you're there to help. You're not there to uh, to do the the fun stuff. Yeah. Right. So a lot a lot around this synthetic data is something we also want to do a lot. Uh, I was playing with last month, and now there is like a real a real team on it, and hopefully we'll be able to release stuff too. Basically, you can think you know open reproduction of phi one point five phi two. That's something I think should be we, we there's that should be there should be an open reproduction so uh we'll try to to see if we can open source libraries to help people do that if we can open source maybe a first big data set that that's a starting point so we are thinking a lot around this nice and, and given that how is so is so distributed as you said you have pockets of these small teams three to four people do you actually manage people or how, how do you organize the organization then if you have such a distributed network yeah, it's it's a bit complex. So um, I would say a lot of this is uh, there's not a lot of management. Uh, definitely, uh, a lot of this is people. People are also very free to propose their own project and to just do them. So sometimes you can think about Huggy Face as you know a little bit like making your own startup, but you're starting from a hyper place because basically you have all access to the community when you when you start your project at Huggy Face, you, you have this wide, you know, megaphone basically that you can use. Um, so we have a little bit of management, but basically the, the, the hierarchy is very flat. So you have maybe two level at Huggy Face, like with me uh, inside the team, there's team leads. Uh, that can also move actually when there are new project dates, new team leads, uh, and very very quickly you go to um, interns or IC or you know like uh, like team team members le level. But that obviously that's not for everyone. I would say it's a it's a it's a different it's a very specific type of uh, of organization. Yeah, if you like politics, probably not the best place. <laughs> no, <laughs> you feel very lonely. You know, you try to do a politics, but nobody's really listening. People are just coding and trying to build good stuff. So, yeah, super cool. Um, yeah, Michael had a you had a, yeah giving open source product. Yeah, so my advice for open source uh, would be try to build your your business, your company to 
for the very long term. Select investors that are ready to be with you for like a few years. Uh, try to, you know, be very lean. Uh, you know, like a, a low salary, don't hire $1 million per year people to code your thing, you know, try to be very lean, very efficient, do the most you can yourself and try to make it so that you can live long enough that the community will grow and in a few years will be like really happy to, to reward the, this. So that, that at least that's the way we did it. Then there is a couple of other ways, I would say, but uh, you have to be um, very mindful. It's, it's definitely a bit less easy by some aspect to build an open source startup than to, being, uh, to build a closed source startup. Yeah, I guess pros and cons. Um... Mm you get more robust software, you get the community, but then how, how do you make sure you don't go the race to bottom? It's just been yeah. funny looking at the dynamics in the space over, over the over the past months. Like, uh, was it recently when, when Mistral released Mistral, we had like one API was like, whatever the number, like together AI maybe, and then any scale lower than that, yeah. and then the second one, and then the, the end, but the guy was literally like, here it is, it's, it's for free, just use it. And so. <laughs> Yeah, but that, in the end, that's what we want. I think we want AI that's that's for free, and you will make money with other things. You know, you, yeah, you we make money not by selling AI, but all these things: the vertical, the application, the smart uh, domain knowledge that you have. Yeah. That's that's such a crazy property. That's not that intuitive, right? Like you have the hardest pieces of software or or, or anything really, like compilers or, or like AI, it, because yeah. so many smart people are, which are usually not that business oriented, are so attracted to it. That it gets like immediately optimized yeah. maximally and just like put down the cost goes to zero. Whereas folks who are like doing like <laughs> web development on top of models and just like reselling, they're the ones who get the money, which is completely like like from one standpoint super cool because civilization prospers, but from the other standpoint, it's kind of boring because you want to do something that's super hard and you also get money by doing that, which is really hard to do no nowadays. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's funny. It's another. It's another. Uh, yeah, it's another. Yeah, it's yeah. That, that's very. That's 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 very interesting. But it's another. That it's. I think it's a general rule that the more the harder problem, you know, the more tricky. And when I was in like computer science, when I was sorry, when I was doing quantum physics, I had these very very small people. They are solving crazy crazy complex problem. And they were earning very little money because for this very complex problem, you have very little money. And then you have like someone just there like selling shoes and making a million because there's this uh, like a uh, simple idea on how to, how to market them. Yeah, I think it's a general thing, but you should not just make money, right? You should also focus on building something that you're excited to build. I think in the end, you know, that's, you, if you create a startup, you, you'll be there for 10 years. So you, you should at least make something that you found intuitively fulfilling, I think. I agree. There, there was this saying, I don't know, I'm going to butcher it likely, but uh, like Academy is so competitive because the stakes are so low or something like that. That's <laughs> the lower the money there is, the more smart people go into the into the space. It's just like crazy. But like I, I like it. I mean, that, yeah. that's why we had this exponential growth over the past couple of years. It's just like being crazy looking at it um, and yeah, being part of it. Thomas, awesome. Uh, I think we're already over time. If people have, I, I know there are a couple more questions. If you can, if you, if you have some time, you can maybe reply in Discord as well. Um, but I think we replied yeah. most of them. Sounds good. Thanks. That was really awesome. nice. To speak. Really, really pleasure having you here, Thomas.